American politics has traditionally swung from left to right, from liberal to conservative, all the time. All right. For example, when you have the you know you get the you know, George Washington and John Adams, a much more of a liberal-minded type of government, and then of course since comes in uh, Jefferson, Jefferson and his and and his party. It's much more of a conservative wing, right? Well, during, you know, and it, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, after the American Civil War, Reconstruction is much more of a liberal-leaning government, a much more of an activist government. But then, when you get to the Gilded Age, uh, you know, the post-Gilded Age, uh, sorry, post-Reconstruction era, the Gilded Age represents much more of a conservative type of era. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, the Gilded Age is going to happen, because a conservative philosophy is definitely going to dominate much of political thinking in American society. For example, uh, you know, when it comes to these these changes, uh, you know, we have we get people like Karl Marx. They're going to predict that you know what when you start having extremes of winners and losers on, on a large scale, Karl Marx is going to say, you know what, that's you you are reaching the point, you're reaching the, the tipping point of revolution. Right, and he said, not only will it be a socialistic, but even a communistic revolution is going to occur. Well, of course, that, that doesn't happen here, right? Revolutions are about extremes, and for the most part, we're not a bunch of extremists here. What we are about reforms, right? We had we get we, you know we have Congress passing a bunch of laws intended to reform the situation that's going on, like ICC or the Antitrust Act, right? But honestly, that doesn't mean anything for ten years or so, you know. But nevertheless. Um, the Gilded Age is going to be dominated by a conservative philosophy, not just on government, but also on uh, society in general. The catch word of the the catch phrase of the period is known as laissez-faire. Leave it alone, and usually we hear about it with economics. Just leave the economy alone, let it do what it's want, it wants to do. However, uh, you can definitely apply it to not only government but also to uh, to the people and uh, in, in, into society. The government does not regulate, it does not protect. This will prevent states and the federal government from doing things to protect workers and the environment during this period. But why is this philosophy so strong during the Gilded Age? Well, traditional political beliefs, i.e. liberty, is definitely going to play a key role, right? We, are, we, and we Americans believe in liberty and freedom. It starts off as a political polit political uh, philosophy. Americans had originally in interpreted freedom from oppressive government, meaning taxation and better representation, right? Take this out of the realm of politics and apply it to society and the economy, and what does liberty pr uh, promote? Does it promote industri uh, you know, regulation? No. It promotes, it supports laissez-faire. So our traditional political belief in liberty supports the laissez-faireism towards our economy and society. There's also an eth a work ethic. This ethic is work hard, find your calling, be thrifty and prosper to the glory of God. Poverty for the po the Protestant is a sign of, sorry, poverty for the Protestant is a, a sign of God's disfavor, but prosperity is the sign of God's favor, right? So ministers are constantly being preached, uh, about, you know, or is con are constantly preaching that you should not interfere with what's going on in the country because it's God's plan. Probably the most important preacher about this Protestant work ethic was a man named Henry Ward Beecher. His sister, by the way, was Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Henry Ward Beecher was the was basically the minister of one of the biggest churches in New York City, sort of kind of the moral leader of America. Listen to listen to what he had to say in 1877. It is true that a dollar a day is not enough to support a man of five children if the man insists on smoking and drinking beer. Is not a dollar a day enough to buy bread? Water costs nothing. Man who cannot live by bread, it is true, but the man who cannot live on bread and water is not fit to live. I don't know about you, that kind of sounds like somebody, doesn't it? If you know, you know a certain somebody named Adolf Hitler, right? Um, so in, in the Third Reich, so I would like to see Henry Ward Beecher, honestly, live on bread and water, see how well he does. But nevertheless, uh, to to the moral leader of America, therefore, if you made a dollar a day and, Ro and Beecher's making 40000 well, guess what? That's just God's plan. And that's just part of what's going on during this period.
The conservative philosophy of the Gilded Age bleeds over into other areas. For example, Darwinism. Darwin, in 1859, publishes his book called The Origin of Species, right? This expounded the idea that life, life in, is basically evolving uh, and going to higher and higher uh, life forms, right? And those that adjust best are going to survive, right? This is what's known as natural selection. Well, if you take that out of biology and put it to society, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not much of a stretch of the imagination, Right? A catchphrase during this time period occurred, survival of the fittest. And quite honestly, Darwin never really said it. Uh, sometimes it's called social Darwinism. And the greatest of the social Darwinists is a man named Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer argued that life was indeed evolving to higher and higher life forms, provided, however, that there was nothing that would interfere and help the unfit and restrict the fit. So he was against some of the things that the federal government was doing and also other, other levels of government. For example, no protective tariffs. You're with a protective tariff, what are you doing? You're restricting the fit and helping the unfit, right? How about schools, public schools? If you can't afford to have, to have your children educated, well, guess what? You're, you know, that's, that's just too bad for you. You know, public education allows people that are unfit, i.e. unable to pay for education, uh, to be, to, Bring up, bring them up while you're not doing anything to the people that can that can't afford public education, right? Uh, so he's even against the government quarantine of diseases. Me basically saying, you know what? Well, let's make sure that society that the strongest survive. How? Well, let's just let smallpox go through. Yeah, let's not. Why the heck not? Just do it. Uh, let's see what happens. After all, the people who survived, they're the ones that we want to be in this country in the first place. This is what's called social Darwinism. Another part of this, this conservatism is going to bleed even into children's books and what we call popular conservatism, right? It basically it was the it not only not only is it it's preached it's by, by the rich and powerful, it's also written in children's books. The most important example of this is a man named Horatio Alger. He wrote children's books that had the same theme, rags to riches, and he was widely popular. So there was a tremendous opportunities in the United States, but not for everybody. Industrialization definitely makes the United life in the United States much more complex. Moving from an agricultural society to an industrial one is going to introduce new problems that makes life more complex and difficult for the average American, while at the same time it offers positive attributes.